moving forward here. We're reading the Eternal Poles. This is chapter three with the heading, The Story of Creation is Told in the Upanishads. It is broken into several different parts of which I will pause. It is of the nature of love to require an object. There must be a lover and beloved, enjoyer and enjoyed. The life force bisects itself, so to speak, and through and by means of some entity, experiences its own otherness through union with an oppositely polarized entity. This sundering and meeting, meeting and sundering of the divine immortal lovers constitutes the cosmic drama, the play of Brahm, enacted on whatever plane of manifestation, whether as the dervish dance of electrons in an atom, or by man and women in the dance of life. Noted and described by modern science after its own fashion, it may be found recorded in an altogether different form of words in the Upanishad. In the beginning was the self alone, in the shape of a person, but he felt no delight. He wished for a second. He was so large as man and wife together. He then made his self fall in two, and thence, and thence arose husband and wife. Therefore, he said, we are thus, each of us, like half of a shell. Therefore, the void which was there is filled by the wife. He embraced her and men were born. She thought, how can he embrace me, having produced me from himself? I shall hide myself. She then became a cow, and another became a bull, and embraced her, and hence cows were born. The one became a mare, and the other a stallion, and thus he created everything that exists in pairs. He knew, I am indeed this creation, and he who knows this lives in his creation. The naive form in which the story of creation is cast should not be prejudicial to an appreciation of its philosophical soundness, for it is mono, monism modified by the inherent logical necessity of dualism as a condition governing phenomenality and of phenomenality as a prerequisite to knowledge or apprehension. Four, the exposition proceeds. When there is, as it were, duality, then one sees the other, one smells the other, one salutes the other, one hears the other, one touches the other. But when the self only is all this, how should one see another? How should one salute another? How should he hear another? How should he know him by whom he knows all this? How, O oh beloved, should he know the knower? If we conceive of the life force in this fashion, as an androgynous being intent upon self-knowledge and self-enjoyment, we ourselves cannot be other than that being. This is confirmed by two deepest instincts of human nature the desire to know, and the desire to love and be beloved. And of these, the love desire is prime. Initial and diamonic love. Love, then, is the activity of the life force. But that activity is conditioned by the medium through which it operates, that is, by the personality. And this accounts for the strange, ambiguous, and even contradictory phases which love assumes in human life. They are colorations of the pure white light of cosmic love by medium sometimes so opaque as to transform that light into darkness. But love is always operating to dispel that darkness, and that dispersal goes through phase to which Emerson had given the name, or the names of initial diamonic 
and celestial love. The nature of initial love is known throughout universal human experience. His many signs cannot be told. He has not one mode but manifold, many fashions and addresses, preaks, reproaches, hurts, caresses, actions, service, bandage, and his wish is intimacy. Intimater intimacy and a stricter privacy. The possible shall yet be done and being two shall yet be one. In diamonic love, Cupid wears a different face. It is rooted in conflict. The conflict between the light, which is the life force, and that Luciferian bright darkness of the rebellious angel and man. The personality grown great, a weed of self and schism. The effect of diamonic love on the personality is cathartic but catastrophic. He will never be gainsaid. Pitiless will not be stayed. His hot tyranny burns up every other tie. Therefore comes an hour from Jove, which his ruthless will defies, and the dogs of fate unites. And even the diamonic love is the ancestor of wars and the parent of remorse. The reason why diamonic love takes on this tragical character is because the personality frustrates both itself and others when by the ex exercise or the exercise of free will it puts itself in opposition to the life force. It is destructive because self-destructive. It enslaves and torments because uh, by itself it is enslaved and tormented. When the personality, personality yields itself to the life force, on the other hand, that operates according to its inherent nature and liberates the personality into its own larger life. For although we speak of liberation as something pertaining to the personality, it is life, not the personality, which is liberated. Life alone benefits by the transaction. Love will be a painful experience in proportion as the personality is in opposition to the life force and insensitive, insensitive to its impulsion. Diamonic love is the ancestor of wars and the parents of remorse, and for the reason that the personality is self-willed instead of self-directed. Celestial or cosmic love is the activity of the life force operating through a redeemed or dictated personality, a clear lens, therefore, for the shining of the inward light. This smile is an apt one in that it, again, suggests the value of such a personality to the life force, the value of a lens to a light whose rays, going forth in every direction, may be these means be focused upon any point in the Stygian darkness of suffering, where dwell the long denied. That light emanates from the pure realm of the archetypal world. The difference between celestial and diamonic love, between love before and after liberation, is that the first is unconditional. It acts but never reacts. Until we get rid of our egoism, most of our cosmic life is made up of reactions. Love is a reaction set upon with us, within us by some person who attracts us. One who does not happen to set upon this reaction we do not love. But after liberation, when pure life is in control, love manifests as a force going out from ourselves. It is a searchlight which makes lovable all on whom its beam may fall. It is independent of its object since the light can be turned just as easily upon one as upon another. But this does not mean that cosmic love is not selective. It always and unerringly select, selective at the polar counterpart which enables it to shine. 
And only when united with that polar counterpart does it become completely itself, pure life, pure being, the eternal poles. Of tendency, distribute souls. There need no vows to bind, whom not each other seek but find. They give and take no pledge or oath. Nature is the bond of both. No prayer persuades, no flattery fawns. Their noble meanings are their pawns. And so thoroughly is known each other's purpose by his own. They can parley without meeting. Need is none of forms of greeting. They can well communicate in their innermost estate. When each the other shall avoid, shall each by each be most joyed. The spring freshness of initial love and the storm and stress of daimonic love are not in celestial or cosmic love, transcended and left behind, but transmuted rather into something other, ardent yet serene beauty of a richer vein, gracer, graces of a subtler strain. Neither is sexual love, as many seem to think, in, in interdicted through into polar beings, not necessary. If it persists, it was a changed creature, lamb-like, lion-like, wings were, claws were, self-reversing, self-renewing, every wish one with fulfillment, ever healing, never searing, and blessing, a benison. Cosmic love is beyond good and evil, and all other pairs of opposites, since it descends from the archetypal world within, all forms in one, only forms, dissolves. It transcends all code of conduct, ethics, or morality. These have arisen for the regenimation, regenimation of the personality in relation to other personalities. Sin, shame, benevolence, righteousness, such words have no meaning here because they have to do with the conditioned consciousness and cosmic love is conditioned by nothing except the life force. Blake presents the same idea in dramatizing form in the following poem, which may be read as a, as a complaint and a lament of the fettered personality confronted with the freed conscious. I asked a thief to steal me a peach. He turned up his eyes. I asked a lith lady to lay her down. Holy and meek, she cries. As soon as I went, an angel came. He winked at the thief and smiled at the dame, and without one word said, had a peach from the tree, and still as a maid enjoyed the lady. A good way to think of the personality and the life force is in terms of surfaces and volume. If a surface think of uh, itself and only a surface, it will be full of fear of destruction or impairment, but with the realization that it is one with the volume of which it is it of which it forms the boundary, such fears will cease. An unpublished fable of C. Howard Hinton makes this amusingly plain. Once there were two little balls living together in a fine mahogany box. One of them was made of solid gold and the other of wood gilded to look like gold. This one was carefully packed in cotton wool and kept perfectly quiet in one corner while the gold ball lay around, rattled just as it pleased. The gilded ball, scandalized by such behavior, said to the gold ball, "Why?" Do you carry on like that? How can you be so wicked? You'll rub it off. To which the gold ball answered, rub what off? 
fair enough. Cosmic love is the love of the whole. Therefore, nothing is alien to it. The consciousness subjected to the illusion of separateness, incapable of co uh, cosmic love, but somehow aware of its transcendence, has a wrong idea of it altogether, sentimentalized it, applying it such adjectives as altruistic, idealistic, transcendental, but cosmic love is unsettlement, realistic. And thus concludes chapter.